Wow, here we are for another episode of our All About Lapland podcast, which is broadcasted live to our Facebook channel right now, where all of you guys can interact with me, ask your questions, and propose some new themes for our podcast. Today's theme is the Lapish food. And um, wow, I've been thinking a lot on what kind of um, things we could have, and Lapish food just popped immediately into my mind. And uh, as you might already know, me, myself, and my wife Julia, we are foodies, so we love great food. Here in Lapland, uh, Julia is a chef, and I'm, I'm not a chef, but I like to cook a lot. We visit lots of restaurants in Lapland, and we like to share our experiences with you. And especially for this reason, we have built a new page, a new profile on Facebook and Instagram, which is called Eat in Lapland. So you guys are free to join it, where we have uh, content dedicated only to food. So some content which is not usually visible on this page. Well, sometimes it is, but mainly it isn't. So it's uh, mainly a new uh, content that you guys don't see. And um, if you're watching this podcast, video podcast recorded, I strongly suggest that you push the pause button now and do the following thing. Grab something to eat with you guys, because it's going to be a mouth-watering podcast with all of the images. So grab some popcorn, make some sandwiches, I don't know, <laughs> some olives, some drinks. <laughs> let's uh, let's do it together. And um, when I was preparing for the podcast, I had like my <laughs> I had uh, mouth-watering all the time. So <laughs> that's, uh, that's my best suggestion uh, for the podcast. And um, as usually, you can always uh, listen to it on the major podcasting platforms, including the iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and so on. And please do subscribe to the podcast so you get notified when we are on, and that, of course, of course, helps us grow in the rankings or whatnot, and so more people can uh, know about our content. And we have our first comment on the live podcast. Katinka is saying Ilta, no Ilta van. So good evening to all of you guys. And speaking about the evening, um, I think Saturdays is the is the day that it's uh, most comfortable for me to, to make the podcasts. So before I couldn't tell you <laughs> what day we will have our podcasts. It's a weekly podcast, and we have four episodes in a month. Three out of which is just uh, me rambling along here at my home studio, and the fourth episode is uh, interview with some interesting person. Uh, here in Lapland, which is not recorded live, but outside and sent for your viewing later. So for this live podcast that we're doing three times a week, I think Saturday evening, so far it's the best time for me. We have uh, Stuart joining the chat and already we have a question. Uh, what's the wine like in Lapland? I know what the beer is like, but do you have your own wine? That's a really good question, and unfortunately, no, we don't have wine, because, you know, grapes don't grow here. <laughs> grapes grow um, in some other places, which are much warmer. Uh, what we have here, of course, some, some liquor, some hard liquor. <laughs> All right, the quality is going down already <laughs> with the beginning. So we have Koskin Korva, <laughs> Finlandia Vodka. We have all kinds of derivatives. Sweet derivatives from that. And we also have, in Lapland, we have liquors, um, dessert wines, let's call them like that, based on uh, cloudberry, blueberry, and lingonberry. So this is the kind of, you know, uh, the proud things that we have here in Lapland. And they are manufactured by several um, companies. I think Laponia is the one, the most famous one. So that's the closest thing we have to the wine in Lapland. And, however, I've heard we are now making also some kind of dessert wine in southern Finland. I think it's called... Um, I don't remember the name, actually, but I will look it up if you guys are interested. So that's that's the wine situation we are importing. <laughs> that's the thing. We have Pola and Narogaksh... Oh, sorry, Narong, Narongsak. I'm very sorry. I don't know how to pronounce the name. We have Melanie joining the stream. We have somebody from Greece. I cannot read Greek letters, unfortunately. We have... Anine from Philippines, and we have another question. Uh, Mario Lane Trost is asking, how many hours is it dark in wintertime? 
Well, I would say it's about 20 hours uh, of darkness in the most extreme time in uh, mid-December. So now we are in a very interesting period of time when the day is shortening very fast. So just a month ago, or even less, like three weeks ago, we had midnight sun and uh, we had light all around the clock. And now every day we're losing like 10 minutes of light and the sunset comes even earlier. So um, it will get really dark and a little bit, you know, spooky around end November. And this is when you kind of feel like you are lacking the light and you're lacking this kind of energy because, you know, because of this um, darkness. Uh, at the at the most darkest time, the sun doesn't usually rise at all at some places or it rises just a bit or it stays around the horizon. Still, it's not completely dark, like you have 24 hours of darkness. It gets uh, semi-bright about uh, around uh, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. for a couple of hours. So there is some some um, light and there also there are very beautiful colors in the skies because the sun, which is very low to the horizon level, it still sends lots of beautiful light. So that's quite magical, very soft light that reflects in the snow. That's quite amazing to experience in wintertime. So, I think um, we should go straight to the business now. Of course, do ask questions, uh, any kind of questions, uh, especially about the food when uh, when we have them. And we'll try to get, o- get along with our podcast, which is about Lapish food. So, it's exactly about Lapish food, not Finnish food in general. And probably not the Sami food, because that's a bit different as well. We're talking about Finnish Lapish food. Of course, it shares... Um, many of the same ingredients with the other two two cuisines and we're going to look into them. Um, let's begin. So, um, Lapish cuisine relies heavily on the local ingredients. And you might be wondering what kind of ingredients do we have in the wilderness because Finland and Lapland mostly it's wilderness and it's pretty cold. So stuff doesn't really grow here. You don't really cultivate um, much things here. Nowadays, in modern times, you can. But imagine living uh, even like 100, 200 years ago, uh, 500 years ago, things were very, very difficult. So you would only rely on the ingredients that the nature provides you, the wild nature provides you. And this is the core of uh, the Lapish cuisine um, that we have. So things were a little bit easier in summer because um, you can fish, you can um, hunt a little bit easier. And also you have the gifts of the forests. But um, going into going into winter and especially springtime, I mean, it gets even more difficult th- than that. You cannot pick up any berries nor mushrooms. It's only basically... Uh, the food that you have stored during the summer and autumn time and just more game. So um, things were pretty pretty rough out here, although um, you still could maintain some kind of like balance of food. Um, so people were mainly relying on on nature in summer they were they were fishing and uh, you can also fish in winter as well. a little bit it's a little bit more difficult but but doable. Um, we are talking basically about like this hunter-gatherer mentality. You would uh, hunt for game, for meat, and you would uh, collect some berries in summer, and you would fish, and uh, things were pretty, pretty raw and pretty simple. So um, I think that um, hunting for game was the main source of protein, at least for for the local people. And, of course, occasionally you might end up um, having some extra kind of food. And on a video podcast, we are now seeing um, an image of the eggs, which was were laid by the Kaprikai, Kaprikai bird. And actually, um, this picture depicts uh, four brown... Um, four brown colored eggs, which I actually found this summer by walking at a, at a trail. And the Kaprikai laid her eggs just uh, close to to the trail and she ran away leaving the eggs and I w- we were like uh, really excited about that we took a bit pic- a lot of pictures so um, of course naturally we didn't take any eggs but if I was a hunter gatherer I think I would I would take some and I don't know 
<laughs> make something out of it. <laughs> How would you like your eggs, sir? <laughs> Sunny side up. <laughs> so <laughs> that's uh, that's a bit funny. Um, uh, moving along, we're going to expect some game that we have here in Lapland. So, of course, the main uh, source of game is the reindeer or the caribou here uh, in Lapland. And it's a, it's a great source for any kind of raw materials for the local people. Not only do you get the meat, you get uh, reindeer horn for other kinds of instruments. You get the reindeer fur, which was, you know, used for all kinds of clothes and, and whatnot. And basically they say that in the old days they would use every part of the reindeer to some, to some good. So, um, first they were um, hunting for caribou and for the, for the reindeer. Nowadays, um, since uh, 100 years already, uh, the reindeer are not hunted for, all, but they all have their owner here in Lapland. We have about uh, 4,000 uh, reindeer owners and each reindeer is accounted for. In the summertime and also in wintertime, they are free to roam anywhere they want and basically you can, you can meet them <laughs> just on the road. Uh, we are seeing a beautiful picture that I took in Kilpisjarvi with uh, beautiful snowy fells in the backdrop and a flock of reindeer. <laughs> One of them looking <laughs> very curiously at what's going on into the camera. And um, the reindeer herding, it's, um, it's a tough job, I, would, I, would, I, have to, I have to tell you. It's a tough job, it requires commitment, it requires knowledge. So it's more like a, a calling uh, for the people. And it's something that it's passed um, from generation to generations. And um, in the old days we had more reindeer owners, now we have less, because some of the people, they sell their herd to some, to some other reindeer herders because they don't have time to, to take care of this business. So there are a little bit less reindeer herders now, but the situation is very healthy with reindeer herders. Uh, we have young generations taking over, and I know a couple of uh, reindeer herders here in Rovaniemi area, and they all have some kind of succession line uh, that that is happening. So that's that's a good thing, and I'm really amazed to see uh, the old generation pass on their skills uh, to the young ones. So um, there's um, a lot of work, as I was telling telling you uh, about reindeer herding. The main work it is, is to collect reindeer a few times per year to do the following thing. First of all, they are collected in summer or in autumn to see uh, what kind of uh, reindeer are born and to mark the newborn reindeers uh, for the reindeer herders. And also in late autumn to early winter, some reindeers are collected to, be, to make a decision what uh, reindeers will end up in the freezer and what reindeers will continue uh, their life on this planet and multiply. And speaking about reindeer, we have a question. Melanie is saying, is reindeer sausage good? I think so. It's a wonderful product. Uh, enjoy it, of course, if you can. Uh, moving along. Um, when the reindeer are out there in the wild, they can be basically anywhere in uh, in the limits of a certain certain uh, area, which is about you know it can be five uh, fifty to one hundred kilometers square square kilometers. So sometimes it takes a lot of effort and time to find them and to collect them uh, together. In early spring, in May, uh, reindeer. Have, give birth to the young babies. They are really cute and very nice. Uh, when they're born, uh, in a couple of hours they can already walk and they follow their mom and they make very funny noises to communicate with each other. I'm not going to imitate them because it's going to be <laughs> quite laughable. But if you come to Lapland in summer you might see the reindeer, you might hear these sounds when you see mothers and the cubs together. Uh, the cups grow uh, pretty quickly um, to the full born to the full grown reindeer, and basically we have um, in winter time we have around two hundred thousand reindeer, and about eighty thousand uh, new reindeer are born every year. So um, 
part of that newborn reindeers they end up as the raw material as the meat part of them continue their life well that's of course unfortunate that uh, there is um, there is this thing however um it's also about population control because Lapland's grazing grounds would not keep up with the big number of reindeer because they will eat everything basically. So that's uh, one way to keep the population under control and of course to benefit all of us uh, with this beautiful, amazing uh, ingredient. And as a byproduct of this, uh, we also have reindeer furs and uh, we also have uh, reindeer horn uh, that, is, that is available for, uh, for the people. To, to make souvenirs, to make all kinds of interesting things. So reindeer, of course, is the number one ingredient. In addition to the reindeer, we also have another kind of reindeer, which is uh, which is not uh, uh, half domesticated as the reindeer. Uh, it's called peora. I don't know how to explain it in, in English, but I guess it's a, I get it's I would call it like it's it's a smaller reindeer, and a smaller reindeer. It does live here in Lapland, but mainly it lives more south from here. So these small reindeer, smaller kind of reindeer, those you can um, hunt. And of course, not every day, but they are subject for hunting. While as the northern reindeer that lives in Lapland and uh, in some other areas a little bit south from Lapland, like in Kosamo, uh, they are not hunted for, but they are being uh taken care of by the reindeer herders. So, um, next game ingredient we're talking about is the elk or the moose. And the moose, they're literally wild, so they are hunted. Uh, usually starting this time of the year, in autumn, uh, people hunt for moose. It's a very popular hobby. They have lots of hunters here because people like, like the meat. It's the same thing as with the reindeer. You know, there is a a certain uh, stable population which is kept up and uh, some of them end up as um, ingredients for the kitchen. Then we have a very beautiful Capricai bird and Capricai is a wild uh, Capricai, I think that it's that's how it's called, Riakko in Finnish. It's a wild bird that lives in uh, northern Lapland where you don't have uh, much vegetation, it's only basically like a barren land Yet the, these birds, they find, you know, find food themselves, even in winter time. And they also, um, they dig holes, small holes in, this, in the snow, where they warm themselves up, because uh, snow is a very nice insulator. So that's how they survive the harsh weather. And actually, uh, these uh, birds that you are seeing on the video podcast, we have a snowy land and a lonely... Uh, lonely birch tree and we have two capricai birds one on top of it and another on the ground and uh, this picture I took at Puha Ski Resort this um, this winter so uh, you can even meet them near the ski resorts so basically literally 100 meters from this spot where I took the picture of the capricais people were skiing so that's that's quite amazing not hunting for them but skiing uh, usually capricais are hunted by specialized hunters who who specialize in this bird. In summer they have a little bit different color to their um, to their um, fur, a little bit darker. Uh, the males they still have uh, white uh, white part of their body, but um, the female the females have uh, uh, brown color and which makes them very hard to to notice. And um, next we are going to the bear. And bear is, of course, is the king of the Finnish forest. It's the biggest, um, biggest mammal that we have here in Finland. Um, the population of bears is very limited. And you don't eat bears every day. You don't eat bears or hunt bears every week or not, ever, not even every month. So that's a really rare and special thing. The population is around 200 bears, 2 to 300 bears in Finland. And the government issues a certain amount of uh, warrants, certain amount of uh, bear to be, to be hunted for. But usually um, they do not even fulfill the quota, uh, the hunters, because the bear is a really wise animal. It's not easy, it's not easy to, catch, to catch the bear. 
Um, if you're wondering uh, where these pictures are coming from that I'm showing on the video podcasts, um, you can actually go and see the bears in their wild habitat by joining bear watching tours. They are organized in Kuosamo and Kuchma regions, and I've been on, on a couple, and they were really amazing. Really amazing uh, tours, seeing these uh, wild predators um, in their natural habitat. And that was uh, that was a really, really, really cool thing to do. Uh, I can recommend such a place as uh, Karhotupa and Karhokusum, for example. So you can also do that. And uh, the bear meat, um, it can have a certain type of parasite in its uh, in its system, which it's uh, which can be dangerous for health. But in Finland, all of the bear that bear meat which comes to restaurants is inspected and tested for this parasite, so you can be absolutely sure that it's high quality product. And uh, usually, it's uh, frozen already, like. Um, like with any kind of game, you hunt it and you f- uh, you put it into the freezer. So we are seeing an image of a uh, bear uh, bear meat that comes to to the restaurant. Uh, moving on, we are going to inspect some other sources of ingredients for for Finnish for Lapish cuisine. We have a couple of questions. Uh, Stuart is saying it's really like. Uh, us with the sheep, uh, I presume it's you're talking about Scotland, yes as well, and you guys also have this uh, kind of bird in Scotland very well, and um, Melanie is saying thanks for sharing the info about the food that you eat here, that's right, and we are only getting getting started. Uh, next we are going into the, the, the fishing, and there is a great amount of places to fish in Lapland. We have so many lakes, lakes and rivers. Fishing is accessible to anyone. Unlike uh, uh, hunting, you have to get permits for for each kind of uh, game that you are hunting. There are special kind of uh, times of the year when you can do that. You have to have a licensed uh, gun, etc., etc. So fishing is very, very much accessible. Um, still, you are supposed to. Um, acquire a fishing permit, which is, uh, I don't know, it's not very expensive, it's in like around 15-20 euros, and you can fish all you want with that. Some certain areas, they have uh, special fishing districts, but usually if you approach these areas, there'll be some kind of signs telling you uh, about that. And you can acquire fishing permits here in Rovaniemi at Science Center Pilke, or you can acquire it online, or you can acquire it at uh, the Arkioski chain. So we don't have many kiosks here, so probably the one kiosk you'll find will have uh, the fishing permit available. So uh, what kind of uh, fish we have here? Well, we have uh, white fish, uh, we have perch, we have pike perch, uh, arctic char, vendas, and salmon to a certain extent. Salmon is usually raised when all of the other um, fish that I have mentioned, you uh, usually they are fished in the lakes and rivers. You also have zander. Well, basically there is uh, so many fish out there, but those are the most important ones. Um, to be honest myself, I'm not uh, a big fisherman. I don't like to fish. My passion is uh, the berries, collecting and foraging berries in the forest. We'll talk about that later. Um, if fishing is your thing, uh, or if you're just a beginner, I strongly recommend joining some fishing tours, especially in summer. And you can find uh, professional um, fishermen that will basically show you the craft and how, how you do it, what kind of fish you can have here, where, etc., etc. So strongly, re- strongly recommend fishing tours in Lapland. You'll have lots of lots of fun anyway. At least I did when I when I took my tours, although that didn't make me uh, a fisherman. We also have a question from Madeleine. She's asking, in Lapland or in Finland, do you eat shellfish? We don't have uh, much shellfish in uh, naturally here in Lapland or Finland. We have these um, red uh, things, how, how they call with the with the things, not crabs, but the, the other ones that live in the in the rivers, the red ones when you when you boil them. 
well, <laughs> the, the word escapes me. I've actually never tried it here, because we in Lapland you don't get this ingredient. Probably you'll get it somewhere in southern Finland, so that's a bit weird ingredient for me. Nothing <laughs> particular I can tell you about that. Um, we have many places that um, that you can go fishing and enjoy the views, especially joining the tours, as, as mentioned. Um, one of the peculiarities of uh, Lapland is the fish called Vendes, uh, Moiku in, in Finnish. It uh, lives in a certain lake called Kitkajärvi, which is uh, in Kuusamo region, and partly I think it's uh, in Lapland as well, I'm not sure about that. So it's a very small fish, it's actually a, a relative to the salmon, and um, people, local people love it here, and as the picture shows, you can eat it like, uh, you know, like chips. So <laughs> you don't make fish and chips, you just make fish chips. You can fry it and eat it as as is, like the whole thing. Maybe with the, maybe minus the head, of course, but and the tail. But you basically can eat the whole thing because the spine is so it's so gentle. And we have Mark saying it's Rapois crayfish. So exactly crayfish. So for me, it's uh, something something ex exotic. So <laughs> the word escaped me. And. Um, Speaking about salmon, salmon is a very popular ingredient in Lapish cuisine, but unfortunately uh, most of the salmon that you can eat here, I would say 99.9%, .9 it's raised salmon. Mostly it is raised in Norway, we also raise it here in Finland. Uh, it's a good and bad thing, it's uh, relatively cheap, you can have it everywhere, but it's not the real thing. And uh, I think there are some certain ethical problems with um, and ecological problems with raising uh, salmon. Um, so I'm not going. I'm not going to judge um, judge people who who do that or who eat it. But um, personally, I have. Uh, I don't eat that much salmon anymore because of these uh, these problems. I, occasionally, I I eat that, but considerably less than I used to in the past because of that. That being said, uh, we still have two rivers here in Lapland that have natural salmon. One of the rivers depicted on our video podcast is the Muonio Joki, which separates uh, Sweden and Finland. And um, there, local people who are native to the region, they can go and fish for, for salmon, so everybody cannot do that, they don't have a permission, but uh, you also can if you join a fishing tour. They're a little bit more expensive than the, your regular fishing tours, but if you uh, like that kind of stuff, um, please do uh, join the tours. I think one of the companies that does it is called Salmon Finland, I think. I have to check that out. So, um, another river which has natural salmon is uh, River Teno or Tana Deatno in Sami language, which is uh, in the north of Lapland, in the very north of Lapland, in Norgam in, and it's Joki. And that river, it separates Sweden and Finland. And you can also fish for salmon down there, especially at this time of the year. So last summer I've traveled to Norgam, the most northern part of uh, Finland, and I went to a local uh, restaurant in Norgam, it's called Norgam and Lady Keskus, and they had this uh, local, locally fished wild salmon on offer, and of course I ordered that. It wasn't a cheap treat, it was about uh, 30 euros or something, but I enjoyed it a lot. To be honest, I didn't notice that much difference in the flavor. I mean, there was, there was a difference, but it wasn't huge. It was much better than, much fresher than the salmon that you would buy from the shop. It was much better, but not by, by a big margin. But still, I'm very happy that I, I have tasted, tasted that. So, uh, currently, there is a debate in uh, Lapland to free up some of the rivers. Uh, by freeing up, I mean we have a little bit of a problem with our um, hydroelectric energy company called Kemiyoki. In the 50s and 60s, they started building power plants all over Lapland very fast because the country 
uh, needed energy the co- and very, very uh, fast. And uh, the whole region was in ruins. So they neglected that thing at that time. It was different time from now. And they did what they did. So they didn't build the passageways for the salmon to rise up and go into the natural spawning, spawning uh, grounds. Now there is a big pressure on this um, hydro uh, energetic company to build finally these uh, waves, ways to for fish to to come up and multiply. However, I think it's going to rely still on our pe- still on us people to to help them with that, which is still um, a big question if it's like if it's like the real thing or not when you have you know people who help the fish to spawn and then they release the small ones into into the wild. Well, anyway, it's a difficult question. We're not going to go in there. You have your information. <laughs> so if you want to try real uh, raw wild salmon, you go to the most northern parts of uh, Finland into Utsjoki and Norgam in summertime, August and September. This is when you can taste it fresh. That's what I c- can tell you. Moving on, we are going into the forests and uh, the cool thing about uh, forests here in Lapland that you can roam free anywhere you like, almost anywhere you like. You're not supposed to go to other people's uh, yards and stuff like that. It's called every man's right and every woman's right as a matter of case. So it enables you to hike anywhere you like when there are no fences and uh, you can even stay the night if it's like a temporary thing, just one night in a tent and you can continue moving on. And you can also collect the berries and mushrooms that are grown in Lapish forests. And me and my wife Julia, we are very passionate um, foragers for berries. Well, this year uh, I I was much more passionate than Julia. Julia was uh, a bit busy here at our home and I was really passionate and went to get lots of lots of berries. So uh, the main berry that we have here, the most famous one, is called cloudberry. You can see here uh, in the image, um, it's um, orangey colored uh, berry with different kind of, you know, sections or <laughs> or parts of it. And each part has a little seed inside. Sometimes these uh, cloudberries, they have, we can only have t- like only small uh, two parts, and then you can you can have more. They look like cumulus clouds. That's why they're called cloudberries. I have a few cloudberries here with me, uh, which I collected yesterday. It's not much. The cloudberry season is uh, already off, and um, I only found a few berries. I do have about ten kilos of cloudberries in uh, in my refrigerator right here at home, which is quite nice. And I'm going to taste these cloudberries for you guys because I'm always asked how they taste like and I never actually managed to tell you what it is. So <laughs> I have my cloudberries here. Mm. Mm. The texture, it's quite soft, it's juicy, but you also feel the seeds. So when, you, when you're eating it, the texture is very much like a raspberry, except there is more juice, but the taste is a little bit different. Mm. It's um, it's very refreshing. It's a um, little bit more sour than sweet. There is certainly some sweetness to it. Mm. It has an almondy kind of uh, almondy kind of aftertaste after that. So it's a uh, little bit between a little bit more on the sour side, but you don't need sugar sugar to eat um, cloudberries so it's it's very refreshing it has lots of vitamin C and lots of lots of fiber but I guess it's it's nothing it's nothing uh, like anything else that I can describe for you so it's uh, it's a little bit like it's a little bit like raspberry uh, more into this kind of you know more acidic kind of raspberry with with much more juice well <laughs> nice, I can enjoy some cloudberry in my stream quite quite well. Stuart is saying cloudberry tastes amazing. It's like a raspberry, tastes more sweet than sour. I think it's tasted more sweet. 
well, it depends, I guess. Uh, for me, it's a little bit, it's a nice balance between it being sour and sweet. So, uh, the season to collect cloudberries here, it's, uh, it's just uh, have uh, passed here in central Lapland. I think that it starts around mid-July and it lasts two to three weeks. After that, they are basically gone. They are, they become transparent and they fall off of their, of their, um, thing that they grow on. You can find cloudberries in uh, marshlands, so it's a kind of wet area, like depicted on the picture. So you um, you would put your uh, rubber boots on and you would roam the the wilderness. Lots of mosquitoes, of course, so it's, it's a hard job, mainly because of the mosquitoes, but if you're well protected, it's usually, it's usually fine. Uh, cloudberry grows on um, on um, top of the leaves and you only have basically one berry per um, per growing per leaf and you would you know um, turn and look maybe in uh, 30 centimeters we have another one maybe 20 centimeters maybe you have to walk one meter so sometimes you find uh, a little island of these um, berries, you collect a few, maybe, uh, I don't know, a couple of dozen, and then you move on to the next uh, spot. You have to walk and search for another spot where they grow, etc., etc. This year has been very good with cloudberries, so we are, we are very happy. Um, I'm showing some fresh images that I took a couple of weeks ago, collecting uh, cloudberries, and I have an uh, old-fashioned kuksa cup here, full of... Uh, beautiful cloudberries that, that I've collected. They are now in my fridge. Uh, Catherine is saying Lakka liqueur is also good. So Lakka is one of the names for cloudberry. Another one is Hilla. The third one is Suomorain. So we have, we love this berry so much that <laughs> we have many names for it. And you can, anytime you come to Finland or Lapland, you go to the state alcohol store, liquor store called Alko. And you find cloudberry liquor. So basically you will have, you know, the next uh, next best thing to how it tastes like. Of course, reinforced by the alcohol, which is quite nice. <laughs> quite good experience. Uh, and people on our chat saying definitely a sweet flavor. So sweet, sour and acidic plus some sweetness. That's a nice balance. Um, normally you... You cannot buy frozen cloudberry in the shops in winter. That's quite rare. All of the other berries you can buy, but cloudberry not. Uh, mainly because it's uh, well sorted for uh, berry, very popular berry. Um, it's used in the food industry. It's used by the restaurants and by the people themselves who freeze it up. Uh, some people, they earn some extra money in summer by collecting cloudberries and turning them into the collecting uh, special kind of places where they can sell the cloudberry. And depending on the year, sometimes you might, you might earn like 10 to 20 euros for a kilo of cloudberries. And if you would go and buy yourself a kilo of cloudberry, you would pay 30 euros for a kilo. So they are very, very expensive. So it's much easier and better if you go to collect them themselves. It's much more fun also as well. And basically you can have as much as you like, as much as, you, as can fit into your freezer. I've collected three buckets like this one, three five liter buckets. So I've counted that I have over 10 kilos of cloudberry. So I'm set for the winter with the uh, vitamin C. Anytime I need some dose of vitamin C, I can unf unfreeze uh, a little package that I've frozen and enjoy it, especially with the lapish cheese that we're going to, to talk about. I'm also showing another image where you can meet uh, cloudberries. Um, it's a vast marshland with very few trees and uh, you just uh, go around and look for it. Yes, cloudberry is definitely is definitely the the thing for me. Um, next, after cloudberries, now we are kind of uh, you know in the tail season for cloudberries, at least in Rovaniemi area, uh, possibly in Utsioki area and in Kilpisjärvi area. The season is at its best right now because it's much more colder there, so they are ripening a little bit later. 
but here in Rovaniemi area plus 100 kilometers you basically it's getting more difficult to find them and next after cloudberry season we have blueberry season and uh, you can basically enjoy them all together as I as I often do you can find them at the same spot sometimes um, speaking about the blueberries um, to be really technical with you um, it's a bit different blueberry than you can find in the supermarkets like in your South European UK US supermarkets the blueberry that you can find there it's like a big one and it has a visual resemblance to our blueberry it's much uh, however it's much less concentrated in taste so the blueberry that grows in the Lapish forests it's techni technically called bilberry b i l berry unfortunately i don't know why it's called bilberry for me it's a little bit difficult to pronounce and many people don't know what the hell is uh, bilberry so the correct way to call bilberry is also wild blueberry so i think it's uh, uh, much more much easier way for you guys to understand what we're talking about so wild blueberry it's the one that grows in the forests of scandinavia and russia and probably some other places as well and uh, you go and collect it also it's much smaller but much more tasteful uh, the blueberry season is at its best right now to the end of uh, August and sometimes you can find blueberries in September as well I've already collected about five kilos of blueberries and I'm only getting started. I'll have more actually we were thinking to have um, To have a video about making a blueberry pie for Julia Well, basically she'll be making the pie and <laughs> I'll be watching <laughs> and filming but it's me who collected the blueberries, right? So <laughs> I can I can have it too as well and this info will be featured on our eat in lapland channel so go and subscribe to that one uh, Bernice is saying we have blueberry plants here in our garden but they are bigger berries exactly so the blueberries that you are used to are being grown uh, and um, wild blueberries are the ones that you find in the forest and if you zoom into them they look like uh, little death stars so they have like a part of them is like cut <laughs> there is like uh, a plain part of it uh, moving on we are going to to talk about uh, lingonberries and lingonberries are quite um, unknown berries for most of the people uh, to tell you exactly they are much like cranberries I hope you guys all know cranberries it's a big red berry that grows in the marshes especially in Canada it's very popular and uh, lingonberry it's like a smaller version of that and uh, it grows usually in uh, in batches so we have uh, two three four five up to ten on the on the same uh, same plant and it's uh, very easy to collect lingonberry as well as uh, cranberries are very very sour and that makes lingonberries i think it's one of the few berries that doesn't rotten that's what i've heard at least uh, so you can basically store it in the fridge for a certain amount of time maybe not indefinitely but it won't rot so it's quite healthy to consume uh, this uh, berry yourself um lingonberry is not my favorite i think definitely the best one i like it's cloudberry then the blueberry lingonberry yeah maybe the uh, the thing is that uh, you can actually buy lingonberries in the shop and they're less expensive much less expensive to buy than um, even uh, the blueberries and you cannot even buy cloudberries so that's why um, you make certain decisions that you go collect cloudberries and some blueberries yourself and you can buy some lingonberries but occasionally I do collect some lingonberries myself as well for the sorted reindeer about which we're going to talk a bit a little later we can also forage for mushrooms so mushrooms again is uh, is uh, not my thing I don't like mushrooms that much whether you can collect them uh, as well and many people do so 
um, the most popular mushrooms are of course the the seps that that grows here um, I think that the image I'm showing you they're called morals maybe anyway these are the um, these are the kind of mushrooms that sh that are a little bit poisonous uh, <laughs> funny to say that you have to boil them for a prolonged period of time before they get less poisonous because it it will the poison will get out with the uh, with the water and after that you can you can eat them and they're quite quite tasty but you know <laughs> I would say that most of the mushrooms are not not poisonous uh, <laughs> I, I've probably chosen the the wrong example to represent mushrooms um, what is very popular is also chanterelles or canterelles I don't know how you call them I haven't seen much uh, chanterelles here in Lapish Forest. I suppose they grow a little bit more south from here. So in southern Finland and Estonia. And that's where they got sent to Lapland as well. But I love chanterelles and I love seps. So let me have a little drink here. Stuart is saying, Alex, how can you not like mushroom? It's free food. Well... <laughs> I like berries a lot, it's free food as well. Uh, when I was young, uh, still living in Russia, um, all my family, they were really crazy, um, crazy foragers for berries and especially mushrooms. So I have these childhood memories when the whole family, even an extended family, will go out into the forest, collect the mushrooms all day. And when you will go back home, you know, there'll be this incredible stench of mushrooms everywhere because after the mushrooms get collected they would start immediately cleaning them they will start boiling them they would start um, drying them so the stench was just unbelievable maybe I have some kind of bad childhood trauma about the mushrooms but uh, <laughs> that's how it is I mean I can I can have a mushroom soup here um, every once in a while but it's not my best thing and in this extent, uh, Finnish people are very much like Russian people. They are crazy about mushrooms. Well, some of them at least are. So that's that's quite similar here. Foraging for berries, it's quite similar here in the north, in, in Scandinavia, in the local cultures. Moving on, we can discuss about the root vegetables. Uh, in the old days, um, what I presume root vegetables were not very much in because uh, um, it's a little bit more difficult to to cook them in um, in these kind of conditions. However, I think that in our modern ways with modern cuisine, especially with the influence of the French cuisine and the French techniques, the root vegetables are becoming much more you know easy to handle, much more tasty well you can add butter you can add <laughs> milk to them you can make you can saute them you can grill them you can make anything you like so some of the popular root vegetables are of course uh, lapish potatoes called puikula they are also called almond potatoes because they are like small and almond shape not like almond but like a little bit like an uh, size of an egg like a chicken egg so these are quite popular. Of, of course, you have carrots, you have sweets, you have uh, beetroots. Beetroot is my favorite root vegetables. I like beetroot a lot. And uh, you also have uh, all kinds of interesting uh, root vegetables that you can try um, in uh, well-equipped restaurants. So... Now I think you have uh, have an overview on uh, the lapish ingredients that we have here provided by nature. We have different kind of uh, game as protein. We have fish as protein as well. We have uh, berries and mushrooms and we have root vegetables. And needless to say, all of these ingredients, they go, uh, they go incredibly well together. So uh, the chefs, they don't even have to, you know, think for too long. You can basically connect the dots anywhere you like with these uh, uh, ingredients and the flavor profiles fit each other very well like the berries and uh, the game they complement each other you can make wonderful desserts out of the berries 
and root vegetables go with with every kind of protein dish or as a vegetarian dish uh, themselves so next we're going to go into different kind of dishes that you can uh, taste in local restaurants we're going to start with the bread and you can try different kinds of bread you can of course taste the rye bread which is uh, very very popular in Finland I personally love rye bread it's uh, to- tastes totally amazing um, it's very healthy much more healthier than baguettes or just you know uh, bread that is based on like pure refinated uh, flour so rye bread it's very healthy uh, native to Lapland you have uh, flat bread which is called Riaska usually it uh, has it's um, white in color so you can you make it with uh, with a flour and you can add all kind of cereal to that you can make it with uh, you can make it with uh, porridge basically the cereal um, kaura you can also add some um, carrot to that or you can also add some potato to that so you have different flavors of riaska you can also buy riaska the flatbread in the shops and you know just uh, put it in the toaster put some uh, you know um, butter on top of on top of it or some uh, salmon on top of it and it's a really really good snack As starters, um, you can often have different kind of uh, soups based on root vegetables and also based on mushrooms, uh, saps in particular. Uh, it's also a nice idea to add a little bit of um, smoked reindeer into that, into the into the soup. It will add so much flavor to that. You also have vendas, of which we already talked about, a small fish that you can fry whole. Uh, minus the head and you can eat it like a like a chip uh, to be honest I'm not a big fan of vendors I understand why people like it uh, vendors is nice it's a little bit um, it's a little bit too powerful as a taste for me and a little bit too you know too specific but I have enjoyed a f- uh, my share of vendors dishes just let's call it that it's not on my favorite list but definitely try that and form your own opinion about vendors um reindeer is one of the popular ingredients for starters and there are many many ways that you can taste reindeer one of the most interesting starters that i had in local nili restaurant was uh reindeer which was uh, frozen and then it was cut into fine slices with uh, some lindenberry and some salad so when i was uh, tasting that it was it still was cold uh, in my mouth so that was it was a uh, raw meat but it was raw cold meat so that was really interesting I am not sure if they offer it right now but it was a interesting experience which I would like to have in the future you can make all kinds of pâtés with uh, reindeer and add some chanterelles some onions often they also add um, lichen to to the dish and lichen is the reindeer food so normally people would not uh, reach out to the ground and eat lichen it has to undergo a special kind of treatment for it to be edible it doesn't take taste like much but it's a nice idea it's a nice decoration for fine dining dishes you can have yourself a little bit of reindeer soup just you know plain uh, plain soup like uh, stock with uh, with the reindeer and some lingonberries, I've enjoyed uh, those as well. Many local Lapish restaurants offer a star- big starter plate, which is usually a thick uh, plank of wood on which they assemble different kind of uh, ingredients of Lapish cuisines, and it's a nice way to taste a little bit of everything. Usually you have reindeer in different forms, you have reindeer sausage, somebody already asked about reindeer sausage, in the chat it tastes amazing you can have uh, um, slowly cooked reindeer and you can have dried reindeer you can also taste different kind of uh, fish like uh, white fish salmon vendas so uh, 
the places like this are usually a little bit more on expensive sites so it's like 20 to 25 euros and you pay per person usually you have you're going to have it uh, at least for two persons so it's a little bit a more expensive site but it's definitely worth worth the try especially if you are a newcomer to lapish cuisine you will have uh, a good understanding of the flavors already moving on to our main dishes fishes of course is an amazing protein combined with uh, root vegetables white fish is definitely my favorite with uh, carrots and some puree you also have uh, fried vendors once again in a different uh, different dish salmon is a wonderful ingredient we already touched a little bit on that one of the most classic dishes which i also enjoy from time to time it's a creamy salmon soup it's a very simple soup to make you have uh, cubes of uh, salmon and also potatoes occasionally you would get some carrots there as well i don't like the carrots i think they make it a little bit too sweet you have um some kind of uh, cream base and basically the salmon does its thing it's uh, very tasty this kind of uh, you know fatty kind of fish that makes a really nice nice stock so it's a popular item for lunch and if you are lactose intolerant i think in many places you can ask you know the version with just you know plain uh, stock without the cream and that's also very tasty Salmon is, of course, a wonderful dish uh, with uh, salads and root vegetables. Uh, amazingly, amazingly tasty. But um, if you want to try a special kind of salmon dish, then, of course, I recommend trying some um, glow-fried salmon. And that is uh, slices of salmon fried on the open fire. And actually, just uh, two days ago, I had this experience. We went to a uh, Lapland restaurant, Kotahovi in Santa Claus Village, which reopened again after the uh, the corona break. And we had a wonderful dish of sauteed reindeer and salmon, which was cooked right there in front of our eyes. Of course, it's the raised salmon, so not the wild salmon. Still, it uh, tastes just wonderful when it's prepared on the open fire. It's uh, totally, totally amazing. So definitely you can taste the char uh, from the fire, so it's not the same thing as it would be prepared on the pan. And of course, potatoes and root vegetables complement that wish very well. Uh, we're going to touch on the uh, local Lapish restaurants a little, a little bit later in this stream, so hang on to that information. Uh, moving on, we will talk about the Arctic char. So Arctic char, it's a little bit like salmon, but a smaller kind of fish. So if you don't like the idea of the fish being raised and you want to try some wild fish, then I would recommend to try the Arctic char because it's a, it's a fish that is found in the lakes. It has a similar uh, flavor to salmon, not that strong as the salmon, but definitely its own kind of salmony flavor it's a smaller fish and it tastes absolutely amazing i love the arctic char so um go and try that moving on we are going to talk about our um meat dishes and of course the reindeer it's the main ingredient um speaking about meat I guess many of you have heard about the sauteed reindeer and we have a beautiful picture of this dish on our screens at the moment which is only two days old and I had this whole plate guys I ate this whole plate of uh, sauteed reindeer it tasted amazing it was uh, my first sauteed reindeer in a while sauteed reindeer has four basic ingredients it has um, mashed potatoes which are on the bottom usually then on top you have this juicy kind of sauteed reindeer so I would say slow cooked reindeer and on the side you have lingonberries and pickles so um, all of these ingredients can be natively found in Finland and in Lapland and the flavor profile complement each other so nicely 
the meat it's very rich in flavor a little bit gamey so the potatoes are creamy and uh, on all their own the mashed potatoes and the meat is a little bit it's a little bit um, it's a little bit on the heavy side so you when you add the sourness two kinds of sour ingredients like uh, pickles and lingonberries which are a little bit sweet then that you know the, your whole palate is occupied with flavor and I'm a, I'm a big fan of lingonberry I like to have a lot of lingonberry on my sodded reindeer so I can I can put like literally 300 grams of <laughs> lingonberry because I just love this berry and especially with uh, the reindeer it tastes amazing Stuart is saying, hungry now. Well, I was telling you, Stuart, <laughs> go uh, have a run on your fridge <laughs> and come back. <laughs> come back to us and <laughs> maybe it will get better for you. <laughs> uh, I was warning you guys about that. Um, you can have solid reindeer in well-equipped Lapish restaurants, but also it's a special kind of dish that you might also have on a special occasion like um, if you are visiting a certain hotel which has a kind of private tipi uh, hut kota hut usually that's what they serve there because it's the most traditional thing so you can elevate your experience by enjoying the same fish in a little bit uh, sorry <laughs> enjoying the same dish in a little bit more different environment like near the fire in uh, uh, lapish tipi so that's uh, a big advice from me as well. Um, one particular um, drink that is native to Finland, it's called Kotikalia, it's homemade beer, it doesn't have uh, alcohol in it, well maybe just a little bit. Um, when I was young I had my share of uh, homemade beer, nowadays I'm not a big fan, I can have an occasional drink, but people say it complements very well the reindeer and the mashed potatoes and the, the sorted reindeer dish that we have discussed previously. So if you haven't tried it in your life, you here you have a chance to do that. We've also touched on uh, some uh, other ingredients like keprakaya and uh, the bear meat and moose as well. Um, moose is very similar to um, reindeer. You can also make sorted moose in the same kind of way. Um, sometimes it can be difficult to even distinguish one from two. Some people can, some people cannot. And um, mousse is um, usually served in some local restaurants. But beware, there are two kinds of mousse. There is mousse which is raised, again, in Germany. And there is mousse that is hunted for. So if you're having your doubts, you can always ask your waiter, what kind of mousse is that? And you can make decisions from there. Uh, usually if you are enjoying a lunch somewhere and the price is, you know, 12 to 15 euros and they have some mousse there, probably it will be the one which is raised. And if you go to a nice restaurant that offers uh, sauteed mousse, probably then it's more likely that it will be the one which is natural, the wild mousse. Uh, the bear meat, um, we haven't really touched about that. Uh, bear meat can only be enjoyed in a few uh, restaurants in Lapland. We have one here, or couple actually, in Rovaniemi nowadays. I've only tasted bear meat once in my life. I only had a, a little bite of that when there was a special tasting kind of opportunity. Bear meat is very expensive. If you order a dish of, um, of bear, uh, for example, bear meatballs, uh, it will be around 45 euros, and if you want like a slice of uh, bear meat, it will be around 60 euros. Um, of course, you guys, you make your own decisions. If you think that it's a little bit unethical, uh, you know, cheers to you guys. I applaud you. Uh, on the other hand, um, we don't kill our bears only for food. Uh, you only have uh, a small number of bears, which is called, which is, which are killed. Uh, every year, so it's, it might be a good opportunity for you. Uh, when I tasted bear, I was actually overwhelmed with flavor. It was at the same time gamey and also very sweet and rich in flavor, like three times more rich than reindeer meat, for example. And when I asked why was that, I was told that it because uh, uh, the bear has uh, all kinds of ingredients on his menu, so 
the bear has uh, berries and mushrooms, but also bears can hunt for, for for a small reindeer or small game as well, because in winter time they are hibernating, so they have to uh, raise their you know fat levels up. That's why they have uh, all kinds of interesting ingredients uh, on their menu, and that makes their meat also very rich. So I will leave it to your um, consideration to if you're going to choose that in a local restaurant or not. Uh, Karen is asking, the homemade beer could it have raisins in it? I'm not sure. I have not. I have never tasted. Um, Homemade beer with anything added to that or on the bottom. Usually it's just you enjoy it as it is. It's a little bit like um, mm, If you have s- kind of lager beers which have a very distinct kind of uh, flavor So homemade beer it's a uh, little bit less fine as a uh, lager beer a uh, little bit less uh, finesse in the taste and um uh, it's a certain kind of, you know, malty kind of flavor. And um, raisins, I, I think raisins would fit the profile, the flavor of profile of home beer very well. Well, it's up to you if you want to try it like that. And um, moving on, we're going to, to discuss some more of the dishes. So caprica birds, I've also tried that and it was interesting experience. I've only tried that once. I probably will have it in the future. It's also very gamey. Speaking about the strong, the strength of the flavor, so reindeer, it's the less gamey out of all of the game. It tastes a little bit like beef, um, quite a lot like beef, uh, like a slow-cooked beef, but a little bit, a little bit more gamey, let's call it like that. So then we have moose, then we have capricile, Capricai, and then we have the bear meat, which is the most uh, gamey kind of flavor profile out of all. Uh, a nice way to try a uh, reindeer, what many restaurants offer, is uh, reindeer cooked two ways. Usually have you have one part of the reindeer which is slow cooked overnight, which is like braised reindeer. I don't know how what is the right name for the technique technique. And the other part is uh, like a, uh, a chunk of uh, filet, which is cooked very fast, maybe one one minute on each side. So you, you can taste it in different ways, complemented by the root vegetables. I can strongly recommend you that. And if you uh, want to try it all, I can definitely recommend going for the reindeer filet. Reindeer filet is quite expensive. I think it's somewhere around... Um, 35 euros for a dish um, Reindeer filet, it's very small, so it's not a, not a big one Usually if you have reindeer filet, you have two small filets and that's basically the whole reindeer's worth of, of filet So there are not many of them available uh, around each year, so it's a little bit more on the exotic side I absolutely love the reindeer filet, although I do not get to enjoy that quite often uh, because of the price. However, I have cooked it, uh, I have prepared it myself a couple of times when we have bought the reindeer meat uh, from the reindeer herders. Speaking about the vegetarian dishes, of course, the root vegetables are perfect kind of choice for that. My favorite is, of course, the... Um, Suddenly, I, I forgot the name of what it's called, uh, the root vegetables. Um, this uh, this red vegetable. <laughs> well, any, anyway, I will, the, the name will, will, um, will get into my mind later as well. And uh, mushrooms, as mentioned already, a creamy kind of soup, uh, which I enjoyed, enjoy uh, once in a while. And you can also combine the both. You can have some root vegetables and some mushrooms mushrooms as well. So let me have a little sip. Maybe I'll remember the name of that uh, root vegetables. Mm. What was the name in English? I really, I really forgot. <laughs> yes, beetroot. Thank you. <laughs> 
that happens when you when you talk a lot you forgot some simple stuff so i absolutely adore beetroot the image that we are seeing here depicts the beetroot prepared in seven different ways that i've enjoyed in a local restaurant at the sky hotel in rovaniemi so we still have um our desserts to discuss about and we still have our lapish restaurants to discuss but next we're going to go into my own recipe on how to prepare the uh, solid reindeer and it's quite it's actually quite easy I understand that you guys you might not have reindeer meat available for you however you might substitute um, northern reindeer meat with any kind of deer meat I'm I'm really, I really think that you can find it in your local freezer and the key is you have to buy it frozen to prepare the dish in a correct way or you can have your, your mousse uh, meat so if you buy a chunk it has to be frozen because it will make uh, the preparation much more easier later sometimes you can have a deer meat which is already sliced and it's frozen that way you don't have to slice it yourself which also might work for you and on our video podcast we are saying the final dish that I have uh, prepared myself in my home kitchen a few years back that's not a fresh image I don't have the fresh ones um, speaking about the reindeer meat it's quite rare to buy it in the shop or in the freezer you almost never buy the fresh meat in the shop I have never done that if you want to buy the fresh reindeer meat you have to contact your local reindeer herder and you have to tell them that you are interested in buying some reindeer meat and you basically buy the whole reindeer for yourself with all of its different kind of meat parts uh, minus of course the parts that you don't need uh, the meat parts we're talking about and uh, you basically put it in the freezer about 30 kilos worth of reindeer meat 20 to 30 to maybe 40 depends on the reindeer so you freeze different parts of it you have a filet you have all of the different parts of uh, of the reindeer you have the legs and the butt so you can make uh, the uh, solid reindeer you also have the bones you can uh, prepare uh, some very nice soup reindeer bones make a wonderful stock so that's uh, a very good tip as well you can use uh, every part of the reindeer meat to your advantage nowadays the situation with reindeer meat has become a little bit better you can actually buy frozen uh, chunks of reindeer meat to be used in sorted reindeer I'm not sure about the filet I guess the price will be really obscene into like uh, 80 to 90 euros for a kilo but uh, you can buy um, frozen reindeer meat to use in the solid reindeer that we are going to prepare now with you guys and Burns is saying I have used venison here in England to make this stew exactly you can substitute uh, the meat with any kind of you know uh, gamey meat of your choice and on our image here we have all of the ingredients that we need um, so when you buy the meat from your reindeer herder you put it in the freezer or it's already frozen for you and you have to take the reindeer meat out of the freezer for like one hour or two hours before that you don't need to unfreeze it completely it has to be just a little bit soft on the outside but it can stay uh, frozen on the inside so you can unfreeze it using some uh, warm water or cold water not don't use uh, hot water you would use your potatoes in Lapland we have the almond potatoes which um, I don't really I don't really care which kind of potatoes I use uh, they just have to be some good potatoes I often use echo potatoes for for that thing you have your um, pickles which are very easy to find and you have your lingonberry and if you don't have lingonberry lying around at home you can always but you can always substitute lingonberry with cranberry frozen cran cranberry I think uh, the flavor profile is very similar some people also recommend using a little bit of onion in the reindeer stew sometimes I use onion but lately I don't I just enjoy uh, the pure flavor of uh, reindeer and you also will need some um, some butter for frying the reindeer and for mashed potatoes and some 
milk as well, milk of your choice. Uh, I cannot really present you with the certain amounts, uh, how, how much amount of what you need. I always make it by eye, so I can never tell you uh, how much do I need. But speaking about meat, you would have at least 300 grams of uh, meat for each person. At least maybe like 400 grams, because, you know, when you warm it up, there is less uh, weight left. Uh, Maybe four to five potatoes uh, for each person, depending on th on the size. So, and the rest of the ingredients are up to your liking. Uh, so Stuart is coming back to our stream. I hope you have some nice sandwiches, Stuart. And he has missed uh, when we talked about the reindeer meat, and he asked us to remind us why you can't buy reindeer meat in the shops. Well, first of all, um, there is not enough of it to be freely bought in the in every supermarket, and it's also a little bit of a more expensive, more kind of you know um, special kind of ingredient. You don't eat reindeer meat every day, maybe once a week, maybe once a month, unless you're reindeer herder when you can eat it every day. But us normal people, non reindeer herders, we don't get to eat it every day. It's a special kind of meal, which is a little bit more expensive. So the price and there is less availability of that. Uh, in some good supermarkets, you can buy frozen reindeer meat, some parts of that, which are usually very expensive. I don't know, 40, 50 euros for a kilo to make solid reindeer and even more expensive for, for a filet. And also many restaurants, they like to buy reindeer meat to, to be used in their kitchens. So you don't get a lot of reindeer meat, you know, freely around. That's why you usually contact your reindeer herder, your local reindeer herder, and you buy the whole reindeer worth of meat and put it in the freezer uh, once uh, once a year. Which probably I would like to do this uh, this autumn and have my freezer stocked up with uh, reindeer meat. I haven't done that in a while. Price-wise, um, and of course, you know, the convenience of it. So let's cook our solid reindeer. You can start your prep by uh, peeling the potatoes and putting them in the cold water on the stove. Always use the cold water and warm it up later so the, all the, the potatoes are evenly cooked. Uh, when the meat is, is ready, you can basically cut it in smaller chunks. Uh, on our video podcast, I'm using one part of the reindeer, which is not the best part. It has uh, lots of uh, fat inside of it or you know, all of some tissues, that's not a problem. I mean, you don't always get the best part. Sometimes it's just, you know, meat all throughout. But I think for this time I had a different kind of chunk. Um, it's the reason why you like to have it frozen. It's because it will be much easier to, to slice and cut through it to make a really fine and nice slices. So if the meat is unfrozen, it's very soft. And basically when you're cutting it, you are making a big mess. And when you are cutting it uh, half frozen, you are able to make tiny, little, beautiful chunks of that. I also use a special kind of knife, which is a coated knife, like a Teflon coated knife. It's my hunter's knife, although I do not hunt. I, I use it for that purpose. Uh, I cook my solid reindeer a little bit differently than traditionally, in two ways. I make bigger chunks and I basically I fry the rain a little bit more than I saute it. That's kind of my taste. I like it a little bit charred. I like my reindeer meat a little bit more like, you know, juicy and, you know, a little bit more crispy. Usually people uh, do it traditionally. They slice it really finely and they put it into the pan. So they do, they do not fry it. They saute it. So it's just, you know, uh, cooked there in the in the warmth of, of, the, of the pot. So it doesn't get... Um, fried, it gets you know warmed up gradually. Depending on the part of the of the reindeer that you're using, you probably would saute it from something from uh, 30 minutes to to an hour until it's uh, nice and juicy and uh, and gentle. So when your prep is done, you can start uh, boiling the potatoes and you can start. Um, frying the reindeer meat you would put some some oil i usually use butter for that kind of uh, application because it's much more tasteful 
and you start uh, frying your reindeer meat. I usually, as I told, I'm more into the frying my reindeer than sautéing it. I would fry it for, I don't know, 10 minutes, uh, possibly with uh, onions in it, and then I will put, uh, you know, the pan on it, uh, the, lid, the lid on the pan to sauté it uh, for 10-15 minutes more. And while I'm sautéing my reindeer meat, that gives me a nice opportunity to prepare uh, the mashed potatoes. So our image here, on our image here we have four pots on the stove. We have uh, reindeer meat, which is uh, being fried. I usually fry it like I put uh, frozen chunks in small batches, otherwise the pan will get too cool and you start you will get more into sautéing than frying. So I try to keep my pan hot enough. So I add small chunks of the cold meat inside to keep up the temperature. On my other pot, I'm doing uh, the uh, mashed potatoes. I also warm up some milk for the mashed potatoes. And I also warm up some frozen lingonberry. So if, if it's frozen, you will just put it in a small pan and... and um, warm it up a little bit and I also like to add a little bit of sugar into the lingonberries because they are pretty pretty sour and as you can see from the image I make a lot of lingonberry because I just love that stuff with uh, uh, reindeer meat and mashed potatoes so usually you would have normal people use much more much less than that and many tourists say they don't even like that at all which is a big shame for me <laughs> because I love the lingonberry in this case so next I'm going to prepare the um, mashed potatoes and the right way to prepare a really fluffy uh, mashed potato is to put it through the sieve. So you don't just crush it, you put, you put it through the sieve. So that, that way it's like uh, really fine and really, really, you know, there are no lumps, lumps in that. When this is done, you add some butter and some hot milk to your liking and some salt. How much depends on how fat you want to make it. If I make it myself, I make it very fat because I don't make it every day. So that's that's quite okay. I like it to be very tasty. Uh, you can also uh, slice the pickles any any direction you like. And you start assembling your, your dish uh, that way. So uh, you would put the mashed potatoes on the bottom. Then you would put, uh, we'll make a hole with the spoon in the mashed potatoes to put the sauteed reindeer in there. So as I was telling you, my sauteed reindeer looks a bit different from the restaurant ones. The, the restaurant one has more juice and it also more finely sliced and mine is more like fried. That's my own preference, my own taste. I like to put my lingonberry on top because I eat them together. In the restaurants you have it on the side because you, you don't know if you'll, people will like it all that much or not and then you have your pickles on the side and that's your dish basically very simple all of the flavors complementing each other perfectly so that's my sodded reindeer actually <laughs> I'm, lo I'm looking forward to make it again because <laughs> that's just uh, one incredible dish a very tasty dish uh, one more dish that i have prepared in my kitchen is of course the reindeer filet a uh, reindeer filet, it's like uh, two slices, triangular slices of meat. Uh, when you buy one reindeer, um, you usually get two pieces of filet, the, the right and the left one. And if you're preparing it with your spouse or girlfriend or boyfriend, basically you will share. You have one uh, slice for yourself and one for your loved one. If you're going to a restaurant, depending on where you are, if you're going to a restaurant in uh, Southern Finland, you will usually get one slice of reindeer filet or even a half of that per person because it's so rare and expensive. If you go into the north of Lapland, like Evola region, where you have lots of reindeer, usually they include both parts of the filet in your dish. So that's just kind of regional differences. Uh, there are much more reindeer in the north, so it's uh, more affordable there to make. Just something to keep in mind. Reindeer filet is like any kind of filet, you prepare it like a beef filet. And it's a very gentle meat, it only needs one minute on each side. And basically I make it, uh, I don't even make it medium, I make it um, medium rare or even rare. Um, the reindeer filet 
it's much more gamey than the rest of it. So if you don't like the gamey flavor, you would probably ask for it to be fried to a medium state. But I would not recommend going any more further than that because you will just kill the poor beast, you will kill the flavor. So uh, medium rare would be a safe choice for, for most of you. If you like your meat rare anyway, then just go ahead and you'll have a wonderful experience. Just um, put some salt on top if you're preparing it yourself for some for some lucky reason. Some salt, some pepper. If you want to use some kind of uh, herbs, then rosemary is the best way to go with uh, the ranger filet. And we've enjoyed our ranger filet with some root vegetables, some salad, and also some lapish baked cheese, which is um, another beautiful ingredient that we're going to, to talk about. And... You can also add some cauliflower, some some other fried vegetables. It's an amazing dish, guys. I've enjoyed it so much cooking myself. I only made it a couple of times because they are not lying around, those reindeer fillets, but it was an amazing experience, both at home or at a restaurant. So this is uh, my cooking tip for, for today. Some uh, reindeer fillet, which is a little bit more rare, but if you are preparing some kind of sauteed deer, then it's much more, much more easy to acquire, which I would recommend. All right, let me have a little sip of water before we go into our dessert section. There we go. We are reaching our dessert and we have a question from Fabian. Fabian is asking, do you use any juniper berries with your reindeer or moose meat? Um, I'm not sure what is the juniper berry. I will Google it out very quickly. Juniper. Juniper berry. Let me find it online. We're doing this podcast live for those listeners out there. Out there. So let me let me check. Hmm, juniper berries. Um, yeah, these we have a very similar type of berries, which are usually dark in color. Um, they are darker than the wild blueberries. I think they are called Karnica over here. And um, I don't think I have had many of the reindeer juice with Karnica. Usually carnica or juniper berry if we're talking about the same thing it's something for desserts so not not for the reindeer so going into our dessert section um, in Lapland if you go in a very old-school kind of place or like in a local bar often they can call a cup of coffee a dessert because you know people are not that rich here so even like a coffee it's uh, something special and actually dessert in, in Finnish is called jälki ruoka so after food so technically speaking after food you can have coffee and you can call a cup of coffee uh, an after food not a dessert so after food doesn't really mean it's it's sweet <laughs> uh, linguistically speaking uh, quite often you can enjoy a small kind of uh, cake with a bit of with a bit of uh, ice cream that's a quite a popular small dessert moving on to our uh, all-time classic lapish dessert which is called the baked cheese it's also called bread cheese or cheese bread leipa justo in uh, finnish it's called like that because it is uh, prepared in the oven and then it's kind of basically you know uh, cools cools off and uh, retains its uh, form so when it uh, goes into the oven it's liquid and after that it's uh, uh, it's solid so uh, that's why it's called bread cheese but it doesn't have anything to do with bread whatsoever that's why I've heard that the the right the more correct way would would be to call it baked cheese because that's what's been done to it or squeaky cheese and squeaky comes from the sound when you're when you're eating it uh, the texture of uh, baked cheese is a little bit, uh, a little bit soft, but uh, but uh, but solid. So it's a little bit jelly-like, but a very firm uh, jelly-like. 
Uh, you can find a uh, baked cheese in uh, usually it comes in rounds when it's, and it's prepared in rounds in a small one or a big ones and you can also buy in chunks of it like uh, half or a quarter i usually buy of course the whole thing because uh, that's uh, that's more more affordable a nice uh, round chunk usually costs about six and a half to seven euros in a local in a local shop uh, half of that would be about five euros Baked cheese can be used in salads when you just uh, slice it into cubes instead of uh, feta cheese, for example. You can also warm it up a little bit before adding to the salad. Also works as well. But I think uh, baked cheese is definitely best when it uh, comes into dessert. And cloudberry, our famous slappish berry, it's an amazing complement to the baked cheese. I really love that stuff. That's why I have... Uh, 10 kilos of cloudberry stored in my freezer. Usually, 99% uh, of the times I consume my cloudberry with baked cheese. It's a really nice dessert. And also sometimes can be even a snack for myself. When you're going to the restaurant, um, usually you can have it... Um, usually it's prepared with a little bit more... with a little bit cream, a little bit of sugar or honey and some cinnamon. But I like it just plain baked cheese uh, with cloudberry not even adding uh, any sweetness to that i really like this uh, pure flavors often uh, it is served in a different way it can be served in a lapish kuksa cup like we are seeing on the on the video stream but it will be essentially the same product and i warmly recommend for you to try it it's the kind of dish that you can easily make yourself by buying a slice of that cheese and buying some uh, cloudberry jam in the shop. As discussed, it's very difficult, near impossible to buy frozen cloudberry as is, so you'd buy it as a jam. Uh, the good thing about it is it's, it's already sweet, so you don't have to add any more uh, sugar. You can put it in the cubes and uh, warm it up on a pan. It only takes three minutes or something like that. And then you add some cloudberry jam on top. And basically you're set for uh, the classic lapis dessert. You can also put it in the microwave. Although I don't really like microwaving things. Because it uh, tastes less good in my opinion. Another great ingredient for desserts is of course the blueberry. And you can make all kinds of uh, fun stuff from blueberries starting from the ice creams to to pies to you know whatever you feel like to jams and you can also make like a blueberry soup or something like that if you go to a fine dining restaurant they usually like to show their skills and they might prepare a blueberry in a variety of ways like in a sorbet and then in a kind of you know pastry and uh, sauce and whatnot uh, the good thing about uh, blueberry is that it can be easily made into the products and shipped worldwide, especially this wild blueberry that we have here in Lapland. In our Aurora shop, Totify, we have a great selection of blueberry products. We have blueberry chocolate, my all-time favorite, you know, dark chocolate with blueberry tastes amazing. We also have blueberry coffee, which also is a very interesting flavor. And believe it or not, we have uh, blueberry soap, which is a really interesting experience to to buff yourself with the blueberry soap. So you can check auroshop.fi and help us a little bit out with uh, our stuff. And we offer a 15% discount with code THANK YOU. Sorry for the plug, but I think it's uh, um, fitted the blueberry theme very well. And of course... Uh, it's a, these, these are very nice products, so nothing to be ashamed of. Especially this wild blueberry and chocolate. I mean, mm, it's, uh, it's a yummy. Uh, moving on. We have uh, a special kind of thing here in Rovaniemi. And it's uh, our own local ice cream factory called Arctic Ice Cream Factory. It is uh, run by uh, a local girl, uh, Anna Rekalavia. And she prepares ice creams from uh, local cows, from the, from the milk of the local cows at the village of Lowe. She's very friendly. Not the cow, I mean, <laughs> uh, Anna Rikalavia. And she makes uh, really nice uh, ice creams and sorbets using the local berries, including the, uh, the blueberries 
that are collected here and all the all of the other very interesting ingredients you can buy packed ice creams in local supermarkets in Rovaniemi like Prisma or Central uh, 3k uh, market supermarket in shopping center uh, Rinne for example and you can buy it in Levy I think so in, a, in their supermarkets and you can check the Arctic ice cream factory .fi for the places where you can either buy it or taste it. Many restaurants have uh, this ice cream on offer or as their as their dishes, and this is just mouth watering. I mean, we've went through so many packs of the um, Anarikas um, ice cream over over just uh, this few months. I mean, it's amazing. And you've guessed it. My favorite ice cream is the one with the cloudberry. It tastes absolutely amazing. So we've covered a few of the of the desserts. Of course, you can have a very tasty kind of pastry here, made in, made in Lapland. But I would warmly recommend you to concentrate on the berry-powered desserts. And last but not least, we're going to to get to know the uh, restaurants that uh, serve. Lapish cuisines here and probably we're going to make another stream which is dedicated only to different kind of restaurants that we have in Lapland representing a variety of cuisines but um, in this stream we're going to concentrate on more kind of classic Lapish cuisine and also maybe a little bit more modern kind of uh, Lapish cuisine as well so we will leave a big part of the restaurants out to concentrate on the Lapish flavors and the all-time favorite Lapish restaurants in whole Lapland and in Rovaniemi is the restaurant Nili, situated in the city center. I've been there dozens of times. It's an amazing treat to go there. Uh, they offer the chance to sample all of the ingredients on one plate with their Rovaniemi market uh, wooden plate, uh, which is prepared for, for several people and it's an amazing you know journey through the lapish flavors including the reindeer and uh, the fish flavors and the milieu of this restaurant is just uh, just amazing and it's a uh, it's a very cool experience to, to go no matter what kind of dish you try there uh, recently in Rovani we have a bunch of new restaurants open and one of the streets uh, in downtown, which I call the culinary streets, called Valta Kato. It has lots of restaurants on its side. The restaurant Nili is situated uh, right there on the same street. We also have uh, Arctic Boulevard restaurant in, in the Arctic Light Hotel. And actually, the Arctic Light Hotel has probably the best breakfast in whole Lapland, which I can warmly recommend. And we also have a restaurant Nabo here, N-A-B-O, which one, of, which is uh, one of the latest restaurant open here in Rovaniemi. A restaurant Nabo represents modern kind of Scandinavian cuisine with the respect to local Lapish ingredients, and also with an accent on uh, the vegetarian dishes. So we have a, a great selection of veggie dishes in this place. We've recently visited. The restaurant a few weeks ago we enjoyed it a lot it's a little bit more on expensive side more on the fine dining side but it's worth every penny and they match the food with the drinks very well there the service is very nice so you can enjoy a really beautiful techniques and well-prepared ingredients uh, many of them are vegetarian as mentioned but not forgetting the fish and meat as well so it's it's not only for veggies the meat lovers will like that too quite a lot um, speaking about the salmon soup one of the great places to to find it for lunch it's cafe bar 21 in Rovaniemi downtown um, it's more like a cafe style of place but they serve uh, very good salmon soup for lunch Uh, probably one of the coolest places in Rovaniemi, uh, at least it used to be, things are changing very fast, uh, is uh, the restaurant situated on top of Onaswara Fell at the Onaswara Sky Hotel, 
right now they are doing their renovation so I'm not sure if it's open and if it will look the same as it looked back in the day uh, anymore but one of the features of the restaurants is their beautiful view over Onasvara uh, especially in winter it's an amazing sight with a lot of the snowy trees but in summer as well uh, the restaurant has ranked as the top restaurant in Lapland for several years but of course uh, maybe we now have some new contesters as the restaurant Nabo. We'll see about that. The restaurant in the Sky Hotel, it's a very, very kind of fine dining place. So if you don't like that, maybe this is not the best choice for you. But if you like fine dining and you're willing to spend uh, uh, some money uh, on good food, then that's the place to go. I have had many beautiful experiences at uh, the Onasvara Sky Hotel restaurant. Uh, honorable mention for good restaurants goes to the uh, Santa Claus Hotel chain. At least they are trying their best in presenting uh, the treats of Lapish cuisines in their hotels, which are situated all around Lapland. We have one of them in Rovaniemi. Oh, we have many of them in Rovaniemi nowadays. We have restaurant Gaisa in the center and we have restaurant at their uh, igloo Cottages, cottages on uh, the Arctic Circle. I think now the Eagle Cottage is closed as of August uh, 2020. Hopefully it will reopen in winter. Uh, their selection of local ingredients is quite nice as well. And one of the interesting dishes that I have tried there last uh, winter, or was it the winter before? I think it was the winter before, was the sauteed mousse. So even though it might look like uh, solid reindeer, it was moose, and it was a really nice experience enjoyed with local beer. And as we've now reached the Santa Claus village, one of the coolest restaurants in Santa Village is situated behind the Santa's office at the Santa Claus uh, reindeer farm. Uh, it's in the shape of a traditional teepee, and it just reopened in the beginning of August, and we have had a pleasure to visit it a few days ago enjoyed some beautiful sodded reindeer that was a really nice treat as usually it is uh, the head chef of the restaurant is a reindeer uh, is of a reindeer herder family and the owners are also reindeer herders themselves and they also organize reindeer trips at santa village and other places so naturally they respect local ingredients and this is one of the places where you can taste the glow fried salmon which we did as well really my mouth watering and uh, this is basically as traditional as it as it gets here in Rovaniemi so Nili and the Lapland restaurant Kotahovi of which we are discussing at the moment are the most uh, traditional ones that we can find here on the Arctic Circle uh, honorable mention also goes to Rakas restaurant situated at the Arctic Tree House Hotel. Their chef Jonathan is from UK and uh, he's very skilled with local ingredients, uh, like a really thorough kind of dude. And they make uh, really interesting modern kind of uh, takes on Lapish ingredients, uh, which is uh, very, very nicely done. I can also recommend that. They respect fish and they also go forage for their ingredients into the forest in the summer like many local peoples do. Uh, moving on to the northern Lapland, we have reached Ullas and one of the best place, places to eat there it's the Aurora Estate Restaurant. It is uh, ran by two girls, uh, Sirli and Heidi. Heidi, on the right on our picture, it's um, she's a master chef contender in Finland, twice already, and She's really thorough with local ingredients, especially the reindeer and the fish and the root vegetables. Anytime we went there, which was more than a dozen times in the past years, we have had a really nice experiences. Their menu changes according to the ingredients. So no matter when you come there, you will going to enjoy that. I think for this season, they are reopening on the August of 18, 2020. So go find that restaurant. And one cool place to find in Levi, it's called uh, Sam and Kammi, and it is run by Sami person 
uh, Neil Estioni. He is a musician and he drums his uh, shaman drum and he sings the yoik for his guests. He receives guests in his uh, large Sami tent, Kota kind of tent, behind the K5 hotel in uh, Levy Center. You have to reserve places to be there. You will be offered a nice selection of uh, food there from the from the buffet including reindeer meat and also glow fried reindeer and i have it was really really one of the best glow fried glow fried uh, salmon excuse me that i've ever tried during uh, my corona experiences in lapland so here you have a few places that you can find in lapland we are going to continue our culinary journeys on eat in lapland page Hopefully we will soon make our blueberry pie uh, dessert there and share the recipe with you in some form, most likely in the video form, and we share the recipe and how how much of what ingredients you'll have have to add to that. And of course, please subscribe to our podcast on all of the podcasting apps. Um, we will call it a night for this podcast. Thanks a lot for everyone who joined. We'll see you next time. And for those who are still online now on uh, our Facebook page, uh, if you have any more questions regarding the ingredients, we'll having some, we're going to have some extra time to answer those. So if you have any of those, please type them in quickly so I will be able to, to see them. And I'll have uh, my cup of water in the meanwhile also feel free to suggest uh, different themes that we can discuss on our podcast because uh, it looks a little bit different from a local perspective sometime some things can be a little bit boring for our, for for us locals but might might be uh, exciting and new for you so please suggest uh, those if you like and uh, Regarding the guests as well, I have a few guest podcasts lined up, which are very interesting. But if you have uh, some kind of uh, person in mind or some kind of, you know, at least uh, area in mind of who, who you would like to, to hear from, please, please let me know. So I assume we don't have any more questions. We have been rambling, rambling along for almost uh, two hours. Wow, that's that's a lot. I even forgot <laughs> how to say beetroot. <laughs> uh, that's okay. Uh, stuff happens. That's why we do it live. So we are not perfect. We're doing things on the fly. I'm very thankful to all of you who have watched the podcast. Uh, go and prepare the sorted deer or sorted reindeer or sorted game yourself. It's a wonderful dish. Thanks a lot to Stuart for your comments. Thanks a lot to Karen for enjoying the podcast. I'm going to call it a night now. Thanks for watching and stay cool.